Uh, do you hear me? Is it working? It's not working. Now? It's better. Now? So this is a brief recap of the transfer activity in chain. Yes, so close. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. No, this is serious. Okay. This is a <laughs> okay. This is a brief recap of the easing easing chain. Uh, this is the Hamiltonian of the model. Then we have seen that uh, um, we can map the spins into uh, Majorana fermions, that means of a journal being a transformation. After the transformation, the Hamiltonian looks like this. So you have some projectors on a, uh, two different sectors, uh, depending on the uh, parity of the number of, of spin down. And uh, the, uh, the Hamiltonian is, in each sector is equivalent to a quadratic Hamiltonian. And then, okay, we, uh, we diagonalize the model by defining linear combination of these Majorana fermions uh, that satisfy a particular condition of the commutator between the Hamiltonian and, the, and this, these fermions. And using this definition of the Majorana fermions, then we end up with this Hamiltonian. So we have still the two, the two sectors, and in each sector the Hamiltonian is, uh, is non-interacting. So it's just the sum of the uh, number operator uh, for, each, for each mod of the fermions. Yeah. So these are decoupled, decoupled fermions. And we found this dispersion relation, this mod. So from this, what we, we, we discussed the properties of the ground state of the model. And we have seen that if, we, uh, if H is the magnetic field is larger than one in these units, then the, uh, the spectrum is gapped. Mm -hmm. And the ground state uh, is the ground state of H plus, yeah. which is one of the two quadratic Hamiltonians. So this means that the symmetry is preserved. The state is, is paramagnetic. So this means that the, 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 strongest, the stronger the magnetic field is and the uh, and the more the spins are aligned in the z-direction. Okay? This is the definition of paramagnetic. It's, if instead the h is more than 1, then uh, the, uh, the state is ferromagnetic, spin flip symmetry is broken, and the ground state uh, is not the ground state of h plus or h minus anymore, but it's a linear combination of the two. Indeed, the two ground state uh, become degenerate in the thermodynamic limit. And a particular linear combination of these two uh, is chosen by a, a arbitrarily small magnetic field in the longitudinal direction, which is x. OK, so this is uh, about the easy model. Then yesterday, we investigated the dynamics. Can I erase this? Yes, so. OK. No? This can be useful. Uh, this is not. Okay. Then yesterday we consider uh, the dynamics. In particular, we uh, we studied the um, the harmonic chain. And we consider the commutator between the number x, j of t and p, n, something like this, or the opposite, I don't remember what is the type. And we, uh, we found that in the limit n goes to infinity, okay, this commutator approaches a, uh, a 
okay, a number, which depends on the distance between j and m and the time. And in particular, it was uh, proportional to a Bessel function, uh, which is, uh, what is it? Bessel function was i. Bessel function of 2 j minus l omega t. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we describe the properties of this function, in particular when the when the uh, time is smaller than the distance. Mm? We have seen that this function is very, very small, and uh, so the commutator is approximately equal to zero. Mm? So this, uh, and we interpreted this uh, this phenomenon as the fact that when you when you consider the expectation value of two, okay, the, the effect of the measurement of a one observer. Uh, on the on the on the next on the uh, uh, following measurement at time t, mm -hmm. the first measurement is important only if the the new the new measurement is done at a time which is larger than uh, a particular a particular time, which can be identified with the uh, with the maximal velocity of the excitations of the model. In particular, the phonons mm, times the distance uh, velocity. Uh, sorry, the, the distance divided by the maximum velocity. So what I mean is that as long as you, your time is large, is uh, smaller than the distance divided by the maximal velocity of your excitations, mm, then you are unable to see the effect of the measurement. Okay. If instead the time is sufficiently large. Then you, you start seeing something. And indeed, this special function becomes non zero. And instead of being, uh, well, extremely small, it, it just decays as uh, t to the, to the minus one half. So it's something that you, you can see the effects of the function. Yeah. Exactly. What happens when you, when you plot this function, we have something like this. No? This was. Uh, as a function of omega t. Mm. For small times, it was very, very close to zero. So if you plot it, it really you don't realize that it's different from zero. Then it becomes non-zero. I start doing something like this. Mm. After j minus l. So if the time is not sufficiently large, then the two measurements are completely independent. And you, you don't see the effect of one measurement. Uh, on the other measurement, after, on the on the outcome of the other measurement, you can see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, then, uh, well, today first of all we, I'll show you that the same exactly the same results applies also to the transverse field leasing chain, mm -hmm. and let's see what I mean. So, oh, but you remember the meaning of this, indeed. The meaning of this is that if you we we show we prove action that if this commutator is equal to zero, then it means that we can uh, measure this observable at the time t without uh, having any, without seeing, uh, when, without, yeah, without seeing any effect of the measurement of the observable, of this observable at the initial time. So you measure p at the initial time, and here we measure x, and we don't see the, the, the any, any effect of, of this measurement, of the first measurement. Okay, so. So let's do quickly the same for the for the easy model. And uh, essentially the calculations are the same. Do you remember yesterday that when we defined our, uh, we wrote the, the, uh, the position x and p, mm? as a function linear combination of our ladder operator, A, Doug, and A, mm? is what we did. And then we uh, realized that when you can see the time evolution of these operators in the Eisenberg picture, we realized that this, uh, the, the ladder operator just time evolved with the phase, epsilon k t, at e to the minus epsilon k of t. 
you find the same in the easy model. So you find that if you now compute the time evolution of the Bogoliub of fermions, the diagonalized the model, so if you compute e to the uh, e to the i h plus minus t d k plus minus type e to the minus i h plus minus t, then you find that this is equal to e to the i epsilon k plus minus t b dark k plus minus. Here, okay, the plus minus means that we are in one set or in the other. Okay. So the momenta k, k plus, uh, are moment are such that, okay, e to the uh, i and k plus equal minus one, and the other one plus one. Find this uh, analogously, we have b k plus minus of t in the asymptote pitch is equal to the conjugate of this, the joint of this, so e to the minus i epsilon k plus minus t b k plus minus. Okay. So in order to have the time evolution of this operator, we just plug this expression there, and then we find that a to l minus one of t is equal to 1 over square root of n sum over k s e to the minus i l k s e to the i theta k s over 2 e to the i epsilon k s <coughs> t b dag k s plus b minus k s over square root of 2 and the same for a to l okay I forgot here. Um, e, okay. This plus e to the minus i epsilon k s t b minus k s. And here I'm using that epsilon k s is equal to epsilon minus k s. It's a property of the expression relation, which is related to reflection symmetry of the model. As is a power. Plus or minus, yeah, S, uh, S here. Plus minus. Ah, uh, yeah. <coughs> okay, so we have this. But now, which are the observables in the, uh, in the easy model? The spins. Okay, not really the Majorana fermions. So, for example, we would like to compute the commutator between uh, sigma z at a given site L at the time t and sigma z hmm, at the site n at the time equal to zero. Okay? And see what do we find. <coughs> now, sigma z, you remember, is, a, is the simplest operator in the AZ model. Indeed, it can be written as the product of two Majorana fermions, just two. So this is why I'm considering this operator, just to give you an idea of what you should expect in general. So here we, we have to compute the commutator between i, when you expect, uh, express sigma z in terms of the major fermions, you find i a 2l 12 of t, a 12 minus 1 of t, i a uh, to n a to n minus 1. Hmm. What did I compute? Hmm. So we, we should compute this. Hmm. And to compute this, I use this one. <laughs> So you see, you have the commutator between the product of two operators and the product of two. So the commutator of this form, A, B, C, D. Hmm? And now the idea is to play with this A, B, C, D, my C, D, A, B, 
in order to uh, to introduce uh, some anti-commutator because we know that the anti-commutators between the we, we, between the a's are simple are just numbers and so in the end well these are just well you can follow maybe the steps and you you find that this commutator can be written in this form so you see in each term you have always the operator two operators and in that case means two Majorana fermions times anti-commutators between Majorana fermions because the anti-commutator as we will see now we also we will commute to compute the anti-commutator between the Majorana fermions at the time t and the one at the time zero so we'll see that they are just numbers so they commute with everything so you can rewrite the expression in this form in the end. Now, uh, in our case, these operators A, B, C, D are just single Majorana fermions. Hmm? What is the norm of the Majorana fermions? It's just equal to 1. And this is clear because we, if we consider the squared of the Majorana fermions, A squared is equal to 1. So the norm uh, can be defined as the maximal eigenvalue, so it should be equal to 1. So we actually we have this condition in our particular case. And here, then, I'm using some a property of a, a norm. Then you can show that when you have the, the norm of the sum of terms, is always smaller than the, the sum of the norms of the terms. And now I'm using that this, the norm of this operator is equal to 0. So you find this kind of uh, upper bound for the norm. By the way, what does it mean that the, you, you have the norm of an operator smaller than a given value? It means that if you consider the expectation value of that operator in any, in any state, then such expectation value is smaller than the, the particular value. Okay? So you can prove this, this inequality here. But, okay, we prove. But you, we prove okay, we, uh, I showed this, and then here is just the property of the, of the norm. Where the norm of A plus B is always smaller than the norm of A plus the norm of B. Okay, this is okay. Okay, so, uh, and I'm also using that the norm of AB is always smaller or equal to norm of A, norm of B for this particular norm. Okay. So you, we, we have this upper bound, and the idea is to apply this upper bound in our, our situation, okay? So, well, you see that the ingredients are this anti-commutator between the various operators. In particular, you have uh, always an anti-commutator when you have an operator in the first, on the left of the commutator, and an operator on the right. So in our case, it means that we should consider the, the anti-commutator between these terms and these two. So one operator at a time t, and one at a time zero. Let's compute it. So let's see at least the result, because it's not very illuminating. So can I, can I erase this? I'm going now. Okay. <clears throat> so what do you define if you if you compute this anti commutator? So you find that the anti commutator between A to L minus 1 at the time t and A to N minus 1, this is equal to 1 over N sum over K of E to the I N minus L K cosine epsilon K t. And if you take the limit n goes to infinity, 
this becomes the integral dk over 2 pi integral from minus pi to pi of e to the i n minus l k cosine of epsilon k t. Then the other anticommutator is between a to l of t and a uh, to a to n. This is equal to 1 over n, sum over k of e to the minus i n minus l k cosine, okay, uh, this is exactly equal to the other one, okay, cosine epsilon k t and goes to infinity pi minus pi over pi e to the minus i n minus l. Okay, as a matter of fact, these two integrals are identical anyway. Then you have a to l minus 1t with a to n. This is equal to 1 over n sum over k of e to the minus i l minus n k e to the i theta k sine of epsilon k t. And in the limit n goes to infinity, this approach is the integral minus pi to pi of dk over 2 pi e to the minus n i l minus n k e i theta k sine of epsilon k t. And finally, a to l t a to n minus 1, clearly can be obtained from this one, okay. and this is equal to, uh, I just write the solution, the limit and goes to infinity, which is minus the integral from minus pi to pi, oh, and decay over to pi, e to the i l minus n k, e to the i theta k, sine of epsilon k t. Okay. So this is what you find if you compute this anticommutator, but it's kind of simple. You have to use always the anticommutation relation of the B operator. So you can immediately obtain this relation by yourself. And uh, what you see here is that, okay, the, there is a, a common structure of these integrals. You have always this space, which depends on the distance between the operators. And then there is generally this kind of cosine or sine, so oscillatory behavior you know, with a frequency which, uh, 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 which is given by the dispersion relation. Okay. So what can we say about these integrals? Hmm? So we have, in general, we can, uh, uh, these this integrals can be written as e to the i. There is some sign here as well. Then you have L minus N K, and then you will have another sign plus I S2 epsilon K, so epsilon K T. And then there is some function of, uh, of K, periodic function of K here. Okay. Do you see that these integrals have this structure? If you just expand the sine and cosine, then you realize that you S1 and S2 are just signs. S1, S2 uh, are equal to plus minus 1. So these integrals are a linear combination of this one. OK. So now what do we know about these integrals? Are you able to compute the, the asymptotic expansion? So their behavior in the limit of large t or large distances? Okay, you, uh, the, the, the basic result is that, okay, in the limit of large time, you can expect that they go to zero. This is correct, because we, this is an integral of something which is oscillating very rapidly. So for the riemann lebesgue I think, then you have that the, the integral approaches zero. But we can say something more. So actually, we can co easily compute the, the way uh, how they approach zero. And there are different cases. For example, let's assume that 
the absolute value of L minus N, which is the distance, is, uh, let's assume this is larger than the epsilon prime of K, T, for all K, for a moment. Let's assume that we are in this, in this regime. So what is the consequence of this? So what is it? Uh, okay. Anyway. The consequence is that we can rewrite this integral in this way because this is always larger than epsilon prime. Yes? Well, you see, the results here, you have always this phase, which is the same phase here, and you have always either sine or cosine. When you will write the sine and cosine in terms of the exponentials, then you find exactly this, e to the i epsilon kt with the two possible signs. So this is a general form of this integral. So I'm saying instead of uh, computing the, the behavior of each of this integral, just consider the, this generic Integral and see what can we, what can you say about this? Yeah, this integral. What we have is that uh, from here we see that the g is periodic, is two pi periodic, and everything here is two pi periodic. This exponential, indeed, if you had two pi here because this is integer, hmm? see that it remains itself, and the same here, epsilon k is, pi, is periodic, so I think it's periodic. So you have this kind of integral. So the, what I suggest to you, if this condition holds, is to rewrite this as the derivative with respect to k of this phase, which is e to the i s1 l minus n k plus i s2 epsilon kt. Mm -hmm. But then, OK, when you take the derivative of this, then you, you find s1 l minus n plus i s2 epsilon prime, no? So we have to divide by this term. So we have i s1 l minus n plus i s2 epsilon prime of kt. So you, you see that this is exactly equal to this one. I didn't do anything so far. And then I... Uh, I suggest you to integrate by parts uh, this expression. Why, okay, why I can do this? Because I know that this is always different from zero, the denominator. I'm using this condition now. So the denominator is always different from zero, so I can divide by it, by this function. And so I can write the integral in this way. Now I integrate by parts. When I integrate by parts, I have the integral of this term times this function, computing at the extremal value. But these are periodic function. So this contribution is equal to zero. So finally, I have all the other terms of the integration by parts, which is the integral of the integral of this, which is the phase, the, the phase is the same phase. Okay, I don't write this, it's the same. And then I have the derivative of this function. Okay, of g of k divided by i s1 l minus n plus i s2 epsilon prime k. T. So the results of the integration by part is that I started with this function g, and now instead of having g, I have this other function. And you see that this other function is divided by t, by the time and by the distance. I could repeat this kind of process. No? So I can integrate by parts again, so I, take, I put a derivative here, then I have to uh, move the, the derivative on the other on the other part of the integral. And every time that I repeat integration by parts, I get a factor of 1 over t, or 1 over distance. So this means that the, this expression goes to 0 faster than any power law in the time and distance. In this way, we prove this. And as a matter of fact, you can also prove that this is exponentially small in the time. And we use this condition here. Yeah. What happens instead if you, if you are in the other regime? You cannot apply this, uh, this, uh, 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 this argument anymore. 
And what you find is that the, this integral goes to zero in accord uh, with uh, what uh, uh, was saying. But now it goes to zero as a power law in the time. And OK, we, we, don't, we don't compute it. It's not interesting. You, it, it's easy. You, you can use what is called the stationary phase approximation, which essentially means that you, you seriously expand the phase around the stationary point, and you stop at the, uh, when you, uh, at the second order in the expansion. And then you uh, compute the Gaussian integrals. But anyway, uh, independently of how to perform the calculation, what you find is that uh, this, go to, this goes to zero like t to the minus one half every time that this function is different from zero at the stationary point. Otherwise, it's just a different power law. Not, it's not important. What I mean is that if you have this, you have exponential decay. So this L minus n. I can raise this. So what we find is that every time that L minus N, L minus N is smaller than the maximum over K of epsilon prime K T, okay. so this anti commutator that we computed are always behave exponential, okay, smaller or equal to some exponential X exponentially small, exponentially small uh, exponentially small okay something which is e to the minus t over tau okay tau finite every time we have this condition if instead L minus N is larger or equal to equal, equal, mm, yes, so okay. the max over K, where prime K T, then you have that this anti commutator behave like 1 over T to the 1 half or, or 1 over T to the 3 half, okay, depending on the cases. Anyway, power laws. Now, well, you remember that the, the norm of this, the norm of this, anti uh, of this commutator, sigma z of t, sigma n, was smaller than the absolute value of the, of the anti commutator, of the Majorana Fermions, the four. Mm -hmm. As I showed you before, but now we see that this uh, this anti commutator are behave exponential are exponentially small in the time or not. So this means that they, again, also in this case, we see that when the distance between the operators is smaller than the maximal velocity of the particle times the time, then we have that this commutator is exponentially small in the time. So we have been able to to bound this commutator. And we found essentially the same, the same behavior. Okay. So you need some time uh, the, uh, uh, in, order, uh, in order for the information to reach uh, the point n, you need to wait some time. You need to wait the time that uh, is needed, from, is needed um, uh, by the, the fastest particle to reach n starting from L. So you can imagine you have L, this is position L, this is the position N at the time T, and then you consider now the fastest particle that is moving. So you have all the particles that are moving, and here you have the fastest particle. If the fastest particle is able to reach the point, then, well, when you consider this commutator, this becomes substantially different from zero. If instead it was unable to reach the point, then this means that it's exponentially small. With a, Exponentially small with uh, time minus distance, something like this. Okay. Then the time. Then the, yes. This. This. No. The, the distance 
if the distance should be, oh, sorry, you're right, uh, the distance, if the distance is larger, you're right, okay. I wrote the opposite of what I, what did I do? Yeah, ah, it's okay, yes, it's right. Yeah. Okay. So you see, we consider two different models, okay? One that is mapped to uh, bosons, the other one to fermions, and we found some similar results here. So the, uh, it looks like that the spreading of information is bounded. Uh, so this uh, uh, is bounded. Indeed, these are two instances of a general theorem, which is known as Lee Robinson bound, or Lee Robinson SP, whatever. That indeed is a theorem about the norm of the commutator of two observables in different positions at different times. So the theorem is as follows. Can I just erase everything? Sorry, yeah. I, I don't understand what uh, the B uh, well, What B? So the second line down. Here? This? Yeah. Ah, the V. Ah, well, or. or. I'm sorry. <laughs> there are two possibilities. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, three half. Three over two. You have this every time that the, the uh, this function g has a zero at the stationary point, but the first derivative is not zero. Okay. Because here I'm not sure, depending on the on the function, maybe there are cases where this is t to the three alpha. Anyway, okay. Can I can I raise it? Questions? Other questions? Now see the general theorem. So let's assume that we are in the lattice, spin chain, okay? or oh, oh, spin actually is not, uh, we don't need to consider chains now, just consider graph, general graph, the general lattice. And then you have interaction between nearest neighbor, so you choose your, your kind of graph here, it's going to be something like this for example. So what does it mean? That the interaction is on the bonds. So here you have an interaction. If this is the, the site I, well, how can we call this site? Yeah, the site I and this is the site J, then there is an interaction H, I, J between these two spins, okay? Like in easing, we had sigma LX, sigma L plus one X. This could be H, I, J, okay? So for example, H, I, J, example, example, H, I, J equal, Sigma i x, sigma j x. This is a possibility of an interaction. So we consider a Hamiltonian of the form sum over nearest neighbor hmm, sides in this kind of graph. And you have here h i j. Hmm. And uh, okay, then we select two subsystems here. So let's increase the number of points. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I guess, why not? Can I do this? I think so. Okay. Oh, just to be sure, let's move this. Okay, so now let's select, uh, let's call this, for example, B. And let's call this A. Okay. So you consider two subsystems which are not, uh, which are which are disjoint. So a site either is in A or in B, or outside both. Okay. 
This is the situation. And then you consider an observable in A or and in B, two observables. So for example, because I is in A, also J, this can be considered an observable in A, the one that I wrote here, sigma I, sigma J. Now if we call this K and L, or another observable could be sigma KZ, this is in B, in B. this belongs to, uh, belongs to B. Yeah. Or you can consider, for example, sigma KZ, sigma LX, this belongs to B. So you just consider two arbitrary observables, one in A and one in B. And we call the observable OA, this observable in A, and OB, the observable in B. Then we consider then we consider the uh, this operator here, OA, at the time t. So in the Eisenberg picture at the time t. So we consider the time evolution of this of uh, OA. And the theory is the, the theorem is the following. So the, if you consider the, the norm of the commutator between OA OA no, o, a, of t and OB. This is always a smaller or equal to what is it? a constant, C. The minimum between the number of uh, sides in A and the number of sides in B. Then you have here the norm of the two operators OA and OB. Then you have an exponential of minus D minus V T divided by Xi. So what is D? D is the distance between a and B. So what, do, what does it mean? Is the number of edges in the shorter, the shortest path between A and B. So you should consider the shortest path. You count the number of edges, and this is the distance between the two sets. Then you have that the, the what is it? okay, this I told you, uh, and the rest of the parameters, which are the constant c, the the velocity v. And psi, hmm? these parameters are, are um, constants, and they depend only on the. They depend. Okay, this depend. De depend. De depend on. Ah, depend on. Depend on the maximum. Of uh, i j of the maximum. Ah, okay, uh, actually the, ther the theorem is so general that here you can, you can put some time dependence in the Hamiltonian. So you have the maximum over the time of age. And this depends on this and uh, on the maximal vertex degree of the graph, which is the number of, uh, uh, of links. Okay, the, the degree of the graph, uh, give, given a, a point, you count the number of links from that point. And you can see now the maximal number. Anyway, this is a constant in the lattice. You choose your lattice, so in, in a chain it's just equal to 2, this number. So that depends on this parameter and on the, on the Hamiltonian density. And you see, so that the, the, you can see this is a bound. This is exponentially small every time that the, the distance is larger than Vt like in all the cases that we, that we consider. Otherwise, it becomes a trivial bound. So if you are in the opposite regime, this explodes with the time. So it's, yeah. Sorry, and the normal what is the Ah, a, a, it's just the Eisenberg picture. Okay. It was called that. This is, oh, well, clear, yes. Because, you know, that the norm is invariant under unitary transformation. So here you can write the norm of e to the minus i h t tilde times e to the i h t tilde for the same, no? the 
the same term. But now, OK, you consider this term. This is just a unitary, unitary transformation, so the, it doesn't change the eigenvalues of the operator. So this is completely irrelevant. And now when I act with this time evolution, I change the time, this time and this time. So actually, it holds for uh, every time. And here, instead of having t, you, you would have the difference of the time. Okay. Like you have the difference of the distances. Okay. This is lib this is called this is called this is called lib Robinson bound. And this B here V is the lib Robinson velocity. In the simple cases that we consider, this uh, velocity is just given by the maximal velocity of the excitations. Okay? Otherwise, it can be, well, it's just the parameter of the, of the lattice. What is indeed important is that here we don't have any knowledge about the state. So this is a, a, a bound for operators. So this bound holds for any state that you consider. This is why this is uh, extremely powerful result. Okay. Hmm? Are we happy? And this indeed, yeah. The of the this is, uh, this is xi, is a correlation, uh, correlation length. This is finite. The scale, yes, okay. It depends clearly on the properties of the of the system. It depends on H, in particular on the Hamiltonian. But it's some, it, it is something finite. Okay. Yes, what's your next question? Does D depend on time? No. D is just the. Is the on the exponential d? No, v. Ah, v. V, no, no, it's independent of time. No, v is just time a parameter, v times d. Okay. It's just a parameter that you compute, I give you the graph, the Hamiltonian, that you can compute this v. Compute, okay, if you're able to. But anyway, the, uh, there is this v, hmm, such that you can write this, this inequality. OK, uh, just a few consequences of this, physical consequences. So one of them is one of them. Okay, that I that I like is the following. So let us now, uh, for the sake of simplicity, we consider a spin chain. Okay, I'm going to consider this graph. So we have this chain, and these are our spins. Mm? Now we have the operator, our observables in A. Mm? Now let's consider the time evolution of this observable. So what happens is that, is that the support of this observable spreads <laughs> And then what you can prove is that for a given time, you fix the time t. This is the time. And then you, you define the new subsystem, which you call s. And let's say that the distance between s and a is equal to, it's called l. Then what happens is that you can approximate the time evolving operator, or a, OK, h of t by a, a static, an observable with a support only on s. So you can actually define some operator in s, mm, such that these two, the norm of, of the difference, so the, dis the, uh, the distance between the two operators is small, is exponentially small. So it's small or equal to, uh, small or equal to, there is a constant here, there is Again, the, the length of the subsystem A, 
then you have the exponential of minus L minus V T over Psi. And what is this operator? This operator can be defined as the, the trace over S. Oh, sorry, S is the rest of S bar of O A of T I S divided by the trace over S of I S. So this is just a formal definition. What I what I mean here, I take the, the operator, the time evolves, and I remove the tails. I trace over the tails of the operator. So I found in this way an operator that acts non-trivially only in S. But okay, the important fact is that I can find this operator that acts like the identity outside S that approximate my time evolving operator A arbitrarily well. So I can increase S in such a way that this can be uh, extremely accurate. What is the consequence of this? The consequence is that uh, we see that when we consider time evolution of uh, operators, time evolution results in actually this growing of the support of the operator, a linear growth of the support of the operator. Okay. Yes? Okay, so uh, you mean this expression exactly? So this expression means that, uh, let's imagine now to, to to expand the operator OA of t in the basis of a Pauli matrices, for example. Then you will have uh, uh, the sum. So you have OA of t will be given by some sum. And here you will have some string of Pauli matrices hmm, with coefficients that depend on the time. And these strings can be arbitrarily long. Now, some of these operators are in S, inside S. And some of them are not. So what I mean with this is to remove by end all the operators where the uh, Pauli matrix is outside S. Every time you find this kind, of uh, this kind of term, you remove it. And then so you are cutting, you are truncating the sum here. And what I'm telling you is that if you truncate the sum in this way, which is simply a weird way, a very, a very um, rough way to approximate the operator. Nevertheless, if you truncate this, uh, this operator in this way, then you can prove that if the time is sufficiently large with respect to the, 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 the distance between S and A, then this is a good approximation. Yeah, see, yes, sorry. Uh, S bar is the, the complementary region of E. So the entire space is S plus S bar. Well, this is, okay, uh, you can uh, prove it using this. Uh, the, the proof is not difficult to you, but you need to integrate over the R measure, so I don't, I don't show you how to do it. But it's simple, and it was shown rather recently, as a matter of fact, it's just a matter of 10 years ago. While, okay, Lee Robinson is 60s or 70s, but okay, this result is more recent. This is what I told you. So the, you consider this operator, and this is spreading. Now, when you consider time evolution, you have always to uh, compute a series of uh, commutators with the Hamiltonian. Every time that you commute with the Hamiltonian, because it's nearest neighbor, then you are increasing the dimension of the operator. And this gives you a bound in how this dimension effective size of the operator increases. And it's linear in time. So it increases. Yes, exactly. Okay. Questions? If not, I give you five minutes.
And so here, where is this uh, arbitrary small? I mean, in the, uh, is the, when you consider L minus V, you, you increase L. Because you increase okay. the size of S. Okay. But okay, the light one is given by L equal to Vt when you start having this. Okay, so this if, you, if you want to be very, very close of S, then you have to increase. You have to increase, yes. When this equal to zero? Well, this is just an upper bound. So uh, this is written zero smaller than uh, two. So it's okay. Well, just it becomes trivial. Okay. <laughs> We start again okay. about this year. Okay. I start uh, anyway uh, because I, I I just tell you some important things that will be very useful for the exam. No? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, okay. Well, um, now we'll uh, finally okay at the end of the course so we will start. <laughs> Talking about dynamics, okay, uh, actual dynamics in, uh, in a quantum anybody system, and uh, because there is no time, we will only investigate quantum quenches. Hmm? But first of all, I just want to um, to tell you something about the peculiar time evolution in quantum mechanics. So not only quantum quenches, but what well, well, there is of peculiar. Yeah. So uh, maybe if you if you if you study some dynamics in quantum mechanics, that you know that the, there are two uh, exemplar cases. One is when you you have your state uh, psi, mm? and then you uh, oh, when you are just a moment, you have your Hamiltonian, mm? your time evolving, state, which depends on the time, for example, and then you consider the Hamiltonian that this is the Hamiltonian. It's a function of the time that there's a sudden step. So for example, before the time zero, your Hamiltonian is H0, and then it becomes H1. So what happens to the state here? When, so if this change is uh, sudden, is, uh, is abrupt, the state doesn't change, OK? So when you have this kind of time evolution, if you now consider the state psi at the time zero minus, at the time uh, psi at the time t equals 0 minus, minus epsilon, okay, minus epsilon, and psi at the time t equal plus epsilon, hmm? where epsilon is very small, then you find that the two states are, are equal, and the limit epsilon goes to 0, when you have this sudden, sudden step. Hmm? And this is what we uh, now call quench dynamics. We quench a parameter of the Hamiltonian. We change the parameter of the Hamiltonian uh, suddenly. This is quantum quench. Uh, generally, okay. Uh, 
in practice, you consider step functions. But uh, well, in experiments or whatever, you have always uh, some, uh, uh, some smooth function of the parameters. But as long as this, the region where the Hamiltonian change is small in comparison with the typical energies, then you can assume that it's just a step function. In other words, you can always assume that if this is sufficiently uh, rapid, then the, the, the two states, the state doesn't vary much during, in this time step, okay? Yes. No, for this state, for the Hamilton. Ah, this continuity. This you can you can prove using the well, time evolution in quantum mechanics. Okay. Because you know the time evolution operator up to here is just given by e to the minus i h zero t. The time evolution here becomes okay. Uh, yes, e to the okay. Let's start from which time? From time t zero, t zero t minus t zero. And then here the time evolution operator is e to the minus i h zero minus t zero e to the uh, oh god t uh, minus i h t hmm? let's write this minus t zero so t plus zero plus Anyway, so you can write the time evolution operator and you realize that you are not, uh, the, the state doesn't change. Yeah. Okay, this is one possibility uh, that we will consider. We'll investigate this kind of dynamics. But uh, I just want to tell you that there, are, there is another uh, remarkable uh, kind of time evolution, which is the adiabatic time evolution, which is the opposite, opposite situation. When you have your Hamiltonian, which depends on the on the time, but now it very very slowly with the time. Okay. So and what happens? What happens is that generally, let's assume that you you start from the ground state of the Hamiltonian, hmm? then you change the Hamiltonian very very slowly. For example, let's assume well, we consider our easy model. Mm. Then we start from h very large, infinity. So um, for example, we could start from the state with all the spin aligned the up direction, which is the ground state. So we start from that state, and then we decrease the value of h very, very slowly. Then what happens? That you remain in the ground state of the model. If you, if in the limit of very, of extremely slow change of the parameters. This is true as long as you don't cross a critical point. So as long as there is a gap between the ground state and the first excited state, then you can uh, you can prove this theorem. Also in the case of a quantum anybody system, and this was done actually uh, about uh, six months ago, uh, because okay, the, the first proof of the first proof of this theorem is very old, but it didn't apply to the quantum anybody systems. Recently, it was also proved in this in this domain. So every time that you have a gap then you, you have this kind of what is called adiabatic theorem, and you remain uh, in the ground state of the Hamiltonian. So the state changes, but changes uh, remain in the ground state of the Hamilton. If there is a phase trans if there is a, a critical point, so if you cross a critical point, a phase transition, then you, uh, the theorem doesn't hold anymore. You don't have a gap, and you can produce defects in your state. So it won't, it won't be. Uh, the ground state of the model after you cross the critical point. The critical point, well, in this context, is just that you you consider the gap between the ground state and the first excited state. The uh, yes, uh, what happens is that if you consider the velocity at which you change the parameter, you should you should uh, um, should relate this velocity to the gap somehow. So you have an inequality between the two. If the velocity is sufficiently small with respect to the gap, then you, you, you can use the adiabatic theorem. In the opposite condition, you can't. And maybe you can use the other, the other theorem in the opposite situation. OK. <clears throat> for the, 
for this one? Oh, uh, well, I could give you some names uh, if you're interested in this kind of dynamics. There are uh, interesting results. Uh, for example, you could consider the Landau Zen problem formula. So this is an exact uh, expression for the time evolution of the Hamiltonian of a, uh, of a um, two-level system when you have the, the parameters depends linearly on the time. So you consider Hamiltonian of the form h of t equal, for example, something like uh, uh, something like a delta sigma z plus uh, omega t sigma x. And then, for example, you can play with this parameter omega, and you can make omega very, very small in such a way to use the adiabatic theorem. So, and uh, you can solve this uh, this problem exactly. It was solved in. Uh, it was solved. In, I don't remember now. Do. Okay, I don't remember when, but there is a matter of more than uh, about uh, 100 years ago. I don't remember when. Okay, anyway, so, uh, yeah, okay, you, you can find the exact time evolution. This is not trivial, I would say, so if you try, probably you don't succeed, but if you, if you find the papers, then you understand the paper. And this was done by Landau, Zener, also Majorana, uh, Majorana, is a, ah, 1932, I think, okay, anyway. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I like the proof, uh, Majorana's proof. Yeah. Anyway, so um, this problem, then I give you also another just uh, keyword. Mm -hmm. And another keyword is Keeble Zurek. Okay. Keeble Zurek. Let me check this now. Okay. Kibble Zura mechanism, uh, which uh, uh, describes uh, the time evolution across a critical point. So when you can't apply the adiabatic theorem anymore. So to if you're interested in this kind of adiabatic time evolution, these are two, I think, two, two, uh, oh, this phenomenon, without doubt, to, 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 to check. And also this uh, solution, this exact solution, which is uh, extremely interesting, actually. And it's also useful to, to understand this mechanism. This is actually what was my plan, originally, also to talk about this. And, but, uh, okay, we are late, so I... I won't do it. Okay, that's it. Let's let's consider now our quantum fringe dynamics. So what we what we do? Okay, this kind of study started with uh, uh, von Neumann in uh, okay today uh, something like uh, 20, 1929. Anyway, and but then uh, uh, for a long period they they, uh, they weren't studied anymore, and the reason was they, that the people thought that it was just an academic problem. Okay, so uh, and the problem was that you, for example, consider some Hamiltonian H not. You imagine to prepare the your system in the ground state of the Hamiltonian, so you lower the temperature. So you put in the ground state the Hamiltonian. And then you say, well, now I change some parameter of the Hamiltonian, like a magnetic field. Hmm? I can tilt the magnetic field, or I can change some parameter. If you want, you, you add some interaction, H0 plus some V, some parameter G. Hmm? And then you follow the time evolution with a new Hamiltonian. So you consider this, the state at the time t, which is equal to e to the minus i h t. Psi 0. So you see, this is kind of a simple, well, at least the setup is uh, something extremely simple. And, uh, but okay, when you start considering Hamiltonian quantum many-body system, you can imagine that this becomes a very complicated problem. 
just to allow, when I show you uh, yesterday or the day, the, the lectures before, uh, it, it, when you expand this kind of time evolution in terms of the eigenstates of the Hamilton, you find that you have to sum over all the eigenstates, you have all these phases, so in practice uh, it becomes a, 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 an extremely complicated problem, okay, to solve the time evolution. But uh, nevertheless, okay, the, so what, what happens is that when the problem is complicated, if you have a reason to study this problem, then you do it. But if you don't find any reason, then we don't do it. And so for many years, uh, people just didn't care about this kind of time evolution because there wasn't any reason. But then, okay, in, uh, in the last, uh, after 2004 or something like this, the, the, uh, there was some big progress in the, in the experiments, in cold atoms. And so it was possible to investigate this kind of dynamics, even consider a system of uh, uh, 30, 40 spins. So it means, uh, well, quantum anybody systems. And you can, uh, in this experiment, you can actually, um, you have full control of your Hamiltonian parameters. And you can change these Hamiltonian parameters very, very quickly. Uh, so you can uh, actually investigate this kind of quench dynamics. Mm -hmm. and, and so theoreticians were so uh, happy about this because now we could study this problem again and there is some reason to study it. Okay. So why is this interesting? This is interesting for the, I would say, for the uh, uh, unusual behavior that you find. That you, wouldn't, you wouldn't expect. Indeed, I, uh, we have seen yesterday that we, when you consider the time evolution of, uh, in quantum mechanics, you have all, always this kind of quasi-periodicity. Mm? Okay. Now, uh, what happens, just a fact, is that in all the systems that you generally consider, so you, you choose uh, physically relevant states and Hamiltonians with uh, sufficiently local interactions, then you find that the, uh, in, if the system is sufficiently large, all the uh, observables, all the expectation values approach stationary values. So they, they are not quasi-periodic. But if you, for example, study the Easing model, and you say, well, I start from the ground state of the Easing model with a given magnetic field, for example, infinity, so all spin up. I start with this ground state, and then I consider time evolution with the Hamiltonian of this model with h equal to 2 in the paramagnetic phase. Then you study the time evolution of sigma z, hmm? sigma z as a function of the time. Now, at the initial time, because all, spin, all the spin are up, then we have this equal to 1. Then what you find is that, well, some oscillations here, without doubt, and then just if you compute, this is something that you can compute, you find that it becomes stationary, independent of time. And this is not just a, pro a property of a sigma z, of this observable, it's a general property. So all the observables that you can consider, all the observable with a physical meaning, so all the observable that you can, you can uh, write in terms of the Pauli matrices in some region, they share this common behavior. And for a long time, well, we, we were interested in, uh, because okay, I, I say we, because I was interested in this kind of dynamics in the past years. And uh, our interest, our, um, our focus on, was on, the, on how to describe this kind of stationary behavior. Yeah. And uh, because, well, in general, okay, maybe in, uh, in simple systems like the easy model, we can compute the time evolution observables, but in general, we can't because the models are too complicated and uh, sometimes we can't. So the question was, is there some simple way to describe this kind of expectation values? Hmm? And the answer was uh, apparently yes, there is. So you don't need to follow the time evolution of all the observables, okay, the, the entire time evolution, which is an extremely complicated problem, but there really is some prescription to obtain the expectation value at, la at large times. Okay, now, uh, today, I, okay, we will discuss this, I think, tomorrow. And uh, in particular, we will compute the time evolution of uh, uh, maybe sigma z, I guess, for in the easy model. Uh, okay, but uh, today, 
I would like just to introduce quantum quenches in the easy model and then to, to study a, a different problem which doesn't need uh, calculations. Well, uh, we, that can be solved using some semi-classical arguments. Okay. So first of all, uh, how can we solve this kind of problem in the easy model? Our test model for this in these lectures. So we was the uh, was the procedure. So we have H zero, our initial Hamiltonian, which is minus J sum over L sigma X sigma L one X plus H zero sigma Z. So we we consider an Hamiltonian of this form with some uh, magnetic field. And this is the, the Hamiltonian that describes the time evolution before the quench, the pre-quench Hamiltonian. And we prepare the state in the ground state of this Hamiltonian. Okay? For the sake of simplicity, we consider the paramagnetic phase. Paramagnetic phase means that we are in the ground state of one of the two sectors, H plus, so, because I don't want to consider complications. So just uh, let's assume that H, zero, and now H would be much larger than one. So paramagnetic phase. So this is our H0, and H is given by this. We know the ground state of H0. No? The ground state of H0 is the vacuum of the Bogolubo fermions uh, associated with the, in the sector or in the Nebojbos sector. Anyway, okay? it's the vacuum of these uh, Bogolubo fermions. So we know that the initial state, say zero, okay, is the vacuum. If you want vacuum plus, but it's not, it's irrelevant. And uh, this is defined as the state such that uh, all the B, K applied to the vacuum is equal to zero. Okay. And then we want to set the time evolution and uh, we know from one, year, one, uh, one hour ago that uh, the time evolution of, uh, is simple for the Bogolubo fermions of the Hamilton. H, no H naught. So we show, well, we use actually these results before that if we write the, let's call this zero Bogolubo fermions. Okay. These are the Bogolubo fermions of H zero. Bogolubo, Bogolubo fermions of H0, there is a zero here. But now we consider the time evolution uh, uh, generated by H. So we should consider the Bogolubo fermions of this Hamiltonian, the time evolve easily. So we know that B dag K at the time T is equal to E to the I epsilon K T, B dag K. This is where the time evolution, these are the variables where the time evolution is simple. But our state is defined in terms of the other variable. So we need to find a way to write the initial state in terms of these variables. How do we do this? What's the procedure? So we know the formula. The formula is to, to write the Bogolibo fermions in terms of the Majorana Majorana fermions. You remember, the Majorana fermions are defined independently of the magnetic field. They were just uh, probably, they are the jordan pigna fermions. They, given a uh, spin chain, you can define those fermions. So what I mean, you can write B dark K as a function of the Majorana fermions. Hmm? And we know the relations. We know the relation both if you consider B dark of the final Hamiltonian, of the post quench Hamiltonian, of the Bogolibo fermions of the pre-quench Hamiltonian. You have two different relations. Hmm. Both the, these relations can be inverted, and we wrote the inverse relations. And so we have, from this, we, have, we can express the Majorana fermions as function of the Bogolibo fermions, hmm. B and B and B. We have this 
these relations. The same here. They are function of B0 dag B0. So how can you express the state in terms of the other fermions? Well, you have to, these are our uh, Bogolyubov of the initial Hamiltonian. You express the, them in terms of the Majoran fermions. Then you express the Majoran fermions in terms of the post quench Bogolyubov. And you, you can resolve. Yeah. No, because the Majoran fermions is just defined as a product over J of sigma z times uh, sigma plus. So it's completely independent. They are independent of the, of, the, of the magnetic field. They have been defined uh, for any spin chain without specifying the model. So this is the procedure. OK? Yeah. OK, what I'm saying is that you, you have this relation. Uh, actually, here, you can consider also the time evolution of the, OK, no, you have first the, the, you can write an expression at a time equal to 0. And so using this, uh, uh, this procedure, you find the B, you find B dag 0 k as a function of B dag k, B dag q, or the B dag. And B. You are able to do this. And then you say, I'm interested in the time evolution of this operator. So I have to consider the time evolution of this. But the time evolution of this is trivial. So you have just to put the phase, to plug the phases here. And here you have the time evolution then of, the, of this Bogolyubov, the original one. OK, but the, here we are talking about Bogolyubov fermions, and, but uh, we need to write the state. How do we do this? What is the state in terms of the Bogolyubov fermions? So what does it mean, vacuum? Vacuum means that uh, it's something which is annihilated by all these destruction operators. And so, well, instead of the vacuum, let's consider the density matrix of the vacuum, which is this density matrix, 0, 0. If we just consider a single fermion, can we write this operator in terms of the Bogolyubov of the fermion? What is this projector? For a single fermion, if you have just a fermion, this is equal to B, B dagger. Why? Why I am claiming this? Can you see it? So this should be an operator such that every time that you multiply by the Fermi of B, it should be equal to 0, and this satisfies this, this condition. Every time that I multiply by B dag on the right should be equal to 0, and this satisfies this condition. This should be a projector. So uh, if I multiply this by itself, I should find it in itself. If I do here, B, B dag, B, B dag, I use the anti commutation relations here. So I find that this is B. B, B dag, B dag, minus B, oh, this is B dag, B, okay, minus B uh, squared, B dag squared, but these are fermions, this is equal to zero, and this is equal to one, okay? So this is the value of a single term. Now you can uh, convince yourself, and maybe also during the tutorials, you will, you will discuss this, that the, the vacuum, if you have k fermions, is written simply as the product of the vacuum of all the fermions. No. Maybe not really surprising. Okay. So once we write, we wrote the, uh, the uh, this is the initial state, now we have to consider the time evolution of the state, right? Because we want the time evolution of the, uh, we want the state at the time t. So the density matrix at the time t is equal to e to the minus i h t vacuum, vacuum, e to the i h t. Well, this is uh, b0, the ground state of the original Hamiltonian. I have this. So what I have to do? 
I had to write B in terms of B0 in terms of B. So I had to write E to the minus IHT. And then this will be the density matrix at time zero as a function of B dag and B, E to the IHT. And this is equal to rho zero of E to the minus I H K T B dag K E to the I epsilon K T B K. Hmm? And we have the expression for the density matrix at the time. T. This is what we have to do in the easy model. So it's not, it's not very complicated. You see, just two steps, and we uh, we can get the the time of all the state. And then we, given the density matrix, we can compute the expectation values of all the observables. Okay. And this is what we we are gonna do tomorrow. <laughs> hmm? uh, just completing these calculations and then uh, computing the expectation values of some simple operators and then discussing the infinite time limit. But now I just want to use some uh, some partial result from here. Hmm? In particular, I claim now that can I can I raise this? Is one fifteen? No? It's true this time. Okay. <laughs> so uh, my my claim is that we start here uh, half past uh, eleven this time. So my claim is that when you write the state psi zero. In terms of the Bogolyubov fermions at the uh, of the final Hamiltonian, you obtain this structure. This is equal to the product over k of cosine of theta k minus theta theta zero k divided by two uh, plus uh, i uh, i uh, sine of theta k minus theta k, theta zero k divided by two, b da k, okay, now I'm not sure about the sign, but no, that's fundamental, no? Yeah. I'm playing this, where, well, which are these theta k? Do you remember the definition? It was uh, something like e to the i theta k was equal to h minus e to the i k, divided by right, square root of 1 plus h squared minus 2h cosine k, and the same for e to the i theta 0k, but now with h naught instead of h. You remember, we, we have this kind of, uh, we define this, uh, this theta k when we solve the easy model. So these are just definition, and then you can, you will, I think that you will see this in a tutorial, okay? that you can revive your initial state in this way, where this is the vacuum of these fermions. Well, the, yes, so the, the Bogolubo fermions of the, of the post-quench Hamilton is of H. So, state, this is the vacuum of H, and these are the Bogolubo fermions of H. So physically, what does it mean this? What is the state? So it means that the state is, you see, is factorized. 
So you have that uh, for for each momentum, you have that uh, you can describe it as as a um, as a um, superposition, okay. uh, yes, of uh, uh, of different sectors. Okay, for given k, you can have either the vacuum, which is this term, or you can have two, a pair of particles, k minus k. So this describes two possibilities. You fix k, and then you, you say, OK, either there is no particle, or there, are, there is a pair of particles. And you can do this for, any, for all the k's. So in other words, the state consists of all these about this particle. We should imagine that the, the initial state is just uh, is, a, uh, is a bunch of uh, moving particles with different uh, energies, with different uh, velocities. Mm -hmm. And the only properties that you can evince from here is that either that the, the, this particle can come in, pair, in pairs. So every time that you have a particle with a momentum k, you have another particle with momentum minus k. And because the dispersion relation is uh, symmetric, then they have opposite velocity. So this is our initial state. So this is the physical picture of the initial state. You imagine all these particles in this, uh, in this chain. They are moving. And uh, they, they are originating in every point of the chain because there is translational invariance. So you should imagine all these particles moving everywhere with different velocities and organizing pairs. This is our initial state. And uh, uh, now I would like, uh, OK, there is not much time, but uh, I would like to use this kind of picture to, uh, to compute the time evolution of an observable. It's kind of surprising, because, uh, and we will find the correct result without the, doing any calculation, just uh, thinking uh, of the state in this way, so just with this, uh, uh, this mixture of uh, particles hmm, moving around. And we will compute the time evolution of the entanglement entropy of a subsystem. Okay. okay, this is the goal. So how do we do this? First of all, the okay. The idea is uh, is the following essentially: you have your chain, and uh, I told you that uh, you uh, okay. If you could see now the time evolution here. What you find is just this, this uh, uh, operators evolve you with the phases. So here you have just e to the 2i epsilon kt. This is just the time event. This is the state at the time t. Anyway. So you, you, you fix the time. At a given time, what do you have? You have uh, all these particles that are uh, starting. Okay, maybe I can write the, the, this, is the, this is the time. This is our, our chain. So the initial, the initial state is just this kind of uh, superposition of particles, pairs of particles that uh, start moving okay, with different velocities from zero, pairs of particles. Now you follow the time evolution of these particles, and then you, you consider the time t, this distribution of particles at the time t. And you focus on a particular subsystem. Let's say that this is our subsystem S. Or A, I call it always A, A, our subsystem. And then I'm interested in the entanglement between this subsystem and the rest. So you see that all these pairs of particles are completely independent one from the other. Indeed, the state is completely factorized here. So, uh, uh, in particular, this means that a particle with momentum k is completely uh, uncorrelated. Quant there, there are no correlation, quantum correlation between the particle with momentum k and the particle with momentum k prime, if k prime is different from minus k. The only correlated particle are the one with the, with the same momentum in absolute value. Okay? So the pair is correlated, only the pair. This, the, this particle here is completely uncorrelated uh, uh, with respect to this particle here. So what happens is that you must have the same, the opposite momentum to have a correlation. And moreover, if we assume that the initial state has sufficiently fast decaying correlations, then they should be originated in close by points. And in this picture, we can just assume that they are originated in the same points. So we are saying that the only particles that are correlated in the system are the ones that are produced at the same point. 
and then you have momenta, k, and minus k. These are the only correlation. And we, we are inferring this just looking at the state, the structure of the state, because we see that the different k are completely uncorrelated here. And then we see that there is correlation between k minus k. Then we use that initial state, which is this one, as sufficiently, as exponentially decaying correlation. So we can essentially, we can assume that the correlation are zero, are not zero only if, if the points are very close to one another. And in particular, we assume that the, in this picture that the, uh, they are not zero only if they originate exactly at the same point. This is the picture. So uh, just using this, how can we quantify the entanglement? The entanglement is just that you have to count all the number of uh, pairs such that one particle is, if you consider this pair, such that the one particle is inside our subsystem, A, and the other is outside. Because we want to describe correlation between this part and the other part. So in order to, uh, the, the correlation will be given actually by, uh, we will have contribution from, contribution to this correlation from all the pairs such that, that they connect the inside of the subsystem with the, with the rest. Is this picture clear or not? If it's not, I ask questions. Yes. Okay, the vacuum is just uh, we are in the paramagnetic phase, or uh, anyway, we are in the, in the gap at the case, non critical system. In non critical system, correlations decay exponentially. So this means that if, if you have two points that are at a distance larger than the correlation length, sufficiently larger than the correlation length, the correlation is practically zero. They're independent. Now, what I'm saying is that uh, let's assume this correlation length is finite, and uh, I, I didn't tell you that the scale of this axis. So maybe it's so small here the correlation length that you can distinguish the, the, uh, the, the fact that these two particles can be at a distance psi order of the correlation length. So I'm just saying, let's assume the correlation length is zero. If you want, this is exact if you consider h equal infinity, because now then you have all spin up and the correlation length is actually equal to zero. Was the, well, uh, because I would like to, to see, uh, to, to study the time evolution of the entanglement between the subsystem and the rest after a quantum quench. This is the, the idea. We, um, we want to quantify the quantum correlations between the subsystem and the rest uh, when you study this kind of time evolution, when you change the Hamiltonian parameter. This is the idea that we would like, I would like to do. And I would like to use this kind of pitch. So we see that all the pairs, pairs are uncorrelated, that the, the particle with opposite momentum are instead correlated, and uh, we are using the properties of the initial state when we say that these two particles should come from the same point, assuming that the correlation, the correlation length is zero. So okay, the, the task is to count the number of uh, uh, pairs, such that one is inside, the one is outside, and then we will say that the, we will see actually that the uh, entropy is actually proportional to this number in a sense. It should be weighted in some, in some way that we don't know, so but, uh, it's not important. We'll see it later. And, uh, but the, the, the general behavior will, is given exactly by this picture. Okay. And so, the okay, can you repeat? The, yeah, the, Yes. Yeah, so we have, uh, there are three possibilities for, for well, anyway. Oh, we can have pairs correlated here. They didn't reach the, uh, the subsystem, so they don't contribute to the entanglement with this and this. Then you have pairs that are here. Both are inside the subsystem, so they don't contribute to the entanglement between this and the rest. The only one that contributes is when you have one particle Inside, one outside, which it can be this or can be this situation. So that's right. So the particle 
and the purple one contribute. Okay, purple is invisible. The red one contribute, the other don't. At, le at, at this time, uh, the time. Uh, at this time. At this time. Hmm? Okay. You know, it's too late. Okay, so uh, this is the first thing that we'll do tomorrow. So we'll. Uh, We'll see the consequence of this picture. Uh, we compute. We will compute this uh, this time evolution, assuming that the entanglement is proportional to some cross section of the production of this pair of particles distributed in this way. And then we will uh, we will see we'll study the time evolution at large, large times. Okay. 